The video you're about to see is a real-time recording made at a live ICRI technical session. It is important for you to realize that the remarks of the speaker do not necessarily represent the views of the International Concrete Repair Institute. This presentation is intended to refresh your memory if you attended the session and to allow you to benefit from the speaker's remarks and from the question and answer period if you were unable to attend. Now here is the introduction to the speaker for this session. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Jim McDonald with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, Jim is uh, a senior research civil engineer in the concrete uh, and materials division for the structures laboratory in, uh, for the U.S. Army Engineers Waterway Experiment Station, uh, where he's really been involved in the concrete research for going on 40 years, actually 38 years. And um, Jim's been the author and been involved in many, many technical reports, and he's been a great asset to our industry. And so, therefore, I'll introduce Jim. Yeah, let's make sure it's 38 now, not 40. That's uh, 38's an awful long time. As uh, Stas in the uh, the hand in the uh, program, I want to talk a little bit this afternoon about performance criteria for uh, dimensionally compatible repair materials, and we're speaking primarily about surface repair, partial depth. Uh, uh, non-load bearing uh, repairs in, in particular and uh, the reason for this is that the, the Corps of Engineers is responsible for uh, about 280 navigation locks, uh, about 600 uh, dams, wide variety of appurtenant structures, flood walls, uh, things of that type and most of these are mass concrete structures. Uh, we have uh, very little reinforced concrete so that eliminates a lot of problems that you have so uh, we're primarily concerned with surface repairs to these, so this was uh, the purpose of, of, of this investigation. Uh, many of these structures have uh, had to remain in service well beyond their original de uh, design life. Uh, consequently, aging of this infrastructure has uh, resulted in significant growth in the concrete repair industry. However, in, uh, uh, in all too many cases, we found ourselves repairing repairs. Uh, I think this is uh, generally true uh, throughout the industry. There's really too many premature failures of our uh, repair materials. So what do we do? Uh, give up and uh, keep repairing the repairs? Uh, well, I think that we, we can really do better. Uh, this was a the performance of uh, Corps of Engineers repairs, uh, survey of periodic inspection reports, we found that about half of the repairs were performing in what we considered a satisfactory or, or good manner after uh, a minimum of uh, one to two years. Uh, approximately a fourth had failed and the others were classified as fair or poor. So uh, I think that, uh, uh, that there's definitely the uh, room for some improvement there. So we can uh, call on divine intervention or we can do something else. So what we did was try to come up with some performance criteria to, to minimize this need for repairing repairs. As uh, most of you are aware, there's generally uh, at least five steps, major steps in a successful repair. Uh, for the purposes of this discussion today, let's assume that we've done the evaluation, we've diagnosed the cause of the problem, so now we are ready to select materials and methods that will uh, alleviate the problem and hopefully prevent it in the future. There's a lot of information in the literature on material properties that are considered uh, important for compatible repair. However, specific criteria is generally lacking. In most cases, it's, it's very general like you see. The, this property of the repair material should be equal to or greater than the substrate or conversely and so forth. Well. Well, we are primary owners and we wouldn't get very far trying to use this type of uh, mechanism to specify a repair material. So we need more specific criteria, uh, more, more specific test methods so that whereby we could uh, uh, specify or, well, first of all, select and specify a particular repair material. Consequently, uh, uh, research was initiated by the Corps of Engineers to develop performance criteria for cement-based materials uh, that will provide durable repair with uh, preferably minimal or no cracking. Uh, 
This work was conducted by contract with Structure Preservation uh, Systems and uh, here in Baltimore, uh, Alex Faisbird, who's here, is, uh, was the, the PI on that, and uh, any questions he will answer it. Uh, I will take comments and, and compliments. He takes criticism. The, um, what we did, we took <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the laboratory study was conducted to determine pertinent properties of 12 commercially available repair materials that represented a wide range in uh, composition and properties, particular uh, in drying shrinkage. Concurrent field tests were also conducted to evaluate dimensional stability. Uh, three project sites were selected representing a wide range of environmental conditions. Uh, these were freezing and thawing, uh, high temperature and low humidity, uh, high temperature and high humidity. And these were the ones that were selected. It was basically the field sites were Chicago, Phoenix, and Boca Raton. Each material was used to repair simulated cavities in three precast concrete slabs at each site. The cavities were uh, three inches deep, 18 inches wide, and six feet long. These were precast, the, the slabs were precast quite a ways ahead of time. They were monitored to make sure that they had reached their dimensional stability before we conducted the repairs. This was just to give us a uniform uh, cavity in which to replace our repair materials. In addition to the uh, simulated repairs, we also conducted restrained volume change measurements using both the German angle and the SPS plate test that I'll talk more about later. We monitored the performance of all specimens for a, a minimum of 18 months. Actually, as it turned out, cracking was generally less than we anticipated. Uh, I think this is probably due in part to the excellent uh, attention to detail and workmanship that the uh, SPS crews did at the different sites. Uh, I, I realize that probably don't, all the repairs don't get this uh, depth of attention. The results of these in tests indicate that uh, one half or six of the materials would, uh, uh, would provide satisfactory dimensional compatibility and resistance to cracking under the, uh, the range of service conditions that I just explained. Uh, two materials were susceptible to cracking when subjected to high temperature and low humidity, uh, that is in the Phoenix area, and their performance was rated as, as marginal. Uh, the remaining materials exhibited cracking in each of the exposure conditions, and their performance was weighted as unsatisfactory. It was kind of interesting that, uh, again, the 50 percent of the materials in the study that ex exhibited satisfactory uh, performance correlated very well with our field experience in the core and actual repairs where, again, about half of the materials demonstrate uh, satisfactory performance. Uh, Twenty-eight day results of drying shrinkage res uh, uh, tests were generally lower than, in than expected. Uh, the, uh, also, the, the range in results was much less than anticipated. We tried to select these materials based, uh, we, we tried to come up with a wide range of drying shrinkage based on the, the material data that was furnished by the uh, suppliers. And in most cases, the materials exhibited much lower shrinkage than what we were led to believe in from material, material data sheets and other sources. Uh, actually, as it turned out, nine of the 12 materials exhibited less than uh, uh, 400 millionths or 404 percent drying shrinkage at 28 days. However, it was clear that values beyond the 28-day measurement are required to adequately address long-term drying shrinkage of specimens, in this case 3 by 3 by 11 inch beams. For example, materials 4, 10, and 12 exhibited about the same ultimate drying shrinkage. However, at, the 20, however, at 28 days, their values range by a factor of almost 3. So we, we have to have more than just a 28-day value for drying shrinkage to, our, uh, to give an adequate comparison of uh, candidate materials. Overall, the ratios of peak shrinkage or maximum shrinkage, and this was generally occurred at about a, a year or more, uh, overall these peak values, uh, the ratio of peak to 28-day values range from 1.5 to 5.3 with an average ratio of 2.7. Next step was then trying to correlate the results of these lab tests with what we observed in the field. Uh, this was uh, our correlation. What we did, we had a, a, a rated the, the, those 
simulated repairs that we did in the field based on primarily on their resistance to cracking, rated them one through uh, 12. And if you notice here, we've got three number ones. Well, that was three that we felt were, that didn't crack in any of the areas. We felt like that they were all equally. So that's the reason we have three rated number one, uh, and s as you see here. So <coughs> there was a, uh, a significant correlation between the acceptable field performance and results of the laboratory drying shrinkage test. Uh, again, this is the, the materials that are rated one through eight. That's the satisfactory and the two marginal materials. So there is a pretty good correlation between drying shrinkage and field performance. And this would indicate then that the maximum drying shrinkage at 28 days should not be more than about 400 millions or about 0.04%. There was also a significant correlation between the acceptable field performance and the peak or ultimate uh, shrinkage. Uh, this indicates that the ultimate drying shrinkage should not exceed about a thousand millionths or 0.1 percent at one year age. The ratio between peak and uh, 28 day shrinkage ranged from, uh, for, from 2.3 to 2.6 for field performance rankings of one through eight. That is the the satisfactory and marginal material. So their, their ratio was much closer. You notice that I mentioned earlier that overall uh, it was ranged up to about 5.3. So we did find some significant variations uh, or ratios for the, some of the materials that did not perform as, uh, as well as we would have liked. All materials except two, numbers uh, 10 and 12, exhibited cracking in the restrained uh, ring shrinkage test shown here. Uh, the material number 12 also exhibited good resistance to cracking in the field test. In contrast to its good performance in the laboratory, material number 10 exhibited significant uh, cracking and unsatisfactory crack resistance in the field test. Uh, this perfor poor performance is attributed in, in part to the highest coefficient of thermal expansion of any of the 12 materials. Uh, this is a factor that obviously would not have significant impact in the laboratory under controlled test conditions, but under those uh, widely varying field exposure conditions I talked about, it would come into play. So I think this is a, a, an indication of the, the need for uh, uh, a, a material that uh, has a, uh, uh, there is at least an upper bound on the uh, coefficient of expansion. Uh, these test results also indicate that a material that cracks in the, in the ring test at an age of less than seven days uh, will exhibit unsatisfactory field performance uh, compared to uh, materials that crack at 14 days or, or later would generally exhibit good field performance. This has been just a, in the past, the ring test has been used in many cases just as a pass fail and there was no attention to when or, or at what age the cracking occurred and also to the magnitude of the cracking. So we've tried to go a little bit further with this uh, determine, correlate the age of cracking with, with exposure and also measure crack performance. What we did uh, is measure the uh, width of crack uh, periodically uh, at three points as you've shown here and then calculate the implied shrinkage strains, this by just uh, dividing the sum of the crack widths by the circumference of the specimen to give us uh, a calculated or implied strain. As a case, this is more than just a pass fail. And as we'll see that uh, actually, although some of these materials that cracked in the restrained shrinkage uh, uh, test also, th they did perform satisfactorily in the field performance. There was a, a trend toward improved field performance with decreases in calculated strains. And so the, perform the proposed performance criteria lists, uh, 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 limits implied strain to a, a maximum of about a thousand millionths at one year. In the SPS plate test, a, a beam that's two by four inches in, in uh, cross section and 52 inches long was cast against a thin uh, steel plate. Uh, one end is fixed, the other is free to, uh, to uh, deflect as a, the material dries and then the deflection of that end of the beam is a measure of the, the shrinkage or, uh, uh, or the performance of the uh, material. Material number seven exhibited the highest deflection in laboratory SPS place tests. Uh, the maximum deflection in this case was about an inch and a half, and that was about five times higher than the next highest material, so uh, significantly higher. 
and as might be expected, this material exhibited poor, poor crack resistance in field exposure tests. Excluding the materials that exhibited unsatisfactory performance in, in field repairs, there was a significant correlation between the laboratory SPS plate test and field performance. Uh, test results indicate that this, this plate test can be used to our, our general assessment of a material's resistance to cracking. However, there, we think there's some modifications that need to be made to this to, to make it more accurate, uh, but it, we think it is a promising test. Uh, one advantage of it, uh, the maximum deflections that we observed in this generally have occur occurred within about a month or two months at the max, whereas under the normal, or normal drying shrinkage, uh, it would, as I said, almost a year before we got ultimate strain. So this would be a, a much more rapid assessment of long-term uh, uh, deformability compared to a, a normal unrestrained uh, condition. Uh, field tests indicate that the German angle test can also uh, provide a, a, a general assessment of a material's resistance to cracking when the test specimens are exposed to varying exposure conditions. Uh, this is just a, uh, uh, what was that, two and a, two and a half inch uh, angle, equal leg angle that's filled with the uh, repair material and then that, of course, it's restrained and uh, uh, as the material attempts to contract uh, in many cases, cracks can form. Uh, this was, as I said, in field conditions, uh, this seemed to be a good assessment of, of its uh, cracks performance. In a laboratory, under controlled uh, conditions, none of the materials cracked. So, uh, unless you subject the specimen to some variations in repair, similar to what your material may be expected to see in the field, I, I don't think we can use it as a as a predictor of uh, whether a material may be. Uh, uh, resistant to cracking in, in the field. Compressive strengths uh, range from 4,000 to almost 12,000 PSI with an overall average of about 6,800 PSI. It's generally agreed that the potential for cracking of cement-based repair materials increases with high compressive strengths. Uh, this dis despite the inherently higher tensile strengths that we normally get. Uh, this increased uh, potential for cracking is usually attributed to the typically higher modulus of elasticity, uh, lower creep, and possibly higher shrinkage of high strength materials. However, results of this study indicate that for the range of materials tested, there was no significant correlation between compressive strength and dimensional compatibility. Uh, you see here, the obvious that the three materials that rank number one, their strengths range from 6,600 to 11,000 PSI, so certainly no correlation. Also, the number one and number 11 ranked materials had essentially the same strength. There was some discussion about, you know, including a, a requirement for a minimum of uh, 4,000 PSI as, as a performance criteria. And you might want to do this if you're in a load-bearing situation, but as I said, most of us are, most of our repairs are protective type repairs and we aren't uh, particularly concerned about structural performance. So I was somewhat hesitant to use a, a minimum of 4,000 because when you specify a minimum, that implies that more is better. And uh, I don't think that's the case in, in compressive strength. Uh, values for modulus of elasticity range from 2.7 to 5.9 to 10 to the 6 PSI with an overall average of 3.7. Overall results indicate that, again, for the range of materials tested, there was no correlation between modules of elasticity and field performance. However, it should be noted that 10 of the 12 materials exhibited values for moduli within a relatively narrow range of only about 2.7 to 0.5, but we didn't really have a wide enough range to determine if there was any uh, change. If we exclude material number 11, which had a, a significantly higher modulus compared to the other materials with acceptable field performance, there was a modest correlation between, uh, or at least a trend was for improved field performance with lower modulus of elasticity. Uh, therefore, the proposed performance criteria limits modulus to a maximum value of about 3.5 times 10 to the 6. Results of direct tensile tests uh, range from 90 to 740 PSI, with an overall average of 400. 
overall, again, there was no significant correlation between direct tensile strength and field performance. This is overall. Again, although the trend was for improved field performance with increased tensile strength. However, there was a significant correlation between uh, uh, the results of uh, uh, marginal and unsatisfactory performance and, and, and uh, tensile strength. And these are the materials that uh, perform poorly. And again, that would imply that, you, that we ought to have a minimum of about 400 PSI tensile strength for, for these types of materials. Also, we propose in the performance criteria to use uh, test method CRDC-164 as a, as a standard method for direct tensile tests of cylindrical concrete or mortar specimens. Uh, this was as opposed to the non-standard uh, test that was used in, in the laboratory analysis. Uh, this is a test method that was recently developed by the core based primarily on an ASTM test method for, for testing tensile tests of rock. It's a uh, minimum diameter of two inches is required and a length diameter ratio within between two and 2.5. Values for coefficient of thermal expansion that determined in accordance with ASTM C531 were again generally higher than anticipated ranging from about six to ten millionths per degree elf with an average of about eight. Overall, the trend was for improvement in, uh, in field performance with decreasing coefficients of thermal expansion. So the proposed performance criteria limits uh, coefficient of expansion. And again, we, we would prefer that it be determined in accordance with CRDC 39 to a maximum of about seven millionths per degree F. Whereas the creep, the, uh, creep of concrete and compression has been uh, uh, extensively investigated, Information on tensile creep behavior is generally rather limited. Uh, the lack of, of published data on this is attributed to experimental difficulties and uh, when you require uniaxial loads. Uh, also, it's very difficult to measure the relatively small strains accurately, uh, especially in a material which is drying under load and where shrinkage is the predominant deformation. The, uh, the shrinkage strains for several uh, times greater than the creep strange. Yeah, obviously you can see here that shrinkage was the predominant deformation. Uh, curves are best fit for the creep data. The creep w was determined by subtracting the, uh, the shrinkage strain from the total strain, and then uh, we calculated curves of best fit for that, and then calculated the creep at one year age for comparison purposes. And you see it varied all over the place. Uh, if you, if, but if you exclude materials 5, 10, and 12 from the comparison, the data suggests that the specific tensile strength will average about 1.2 times that of the compressive strength. <coughs> Results of this study appear to contradict the generally accepted theory that higher creep aids in relaxation of stresses and strains induced by restrained shrinkage in concrete, thus reducing the potential for cracking. Although there was no significant correlation between uh, either compressive or tensile creep and field performance, the trend in each case was for slightly improved field performance with decreased creep. And this is just the opposite of what we expected. I think these unexpected results are attributed generally to the higher drying shrinkage associated with the materials that exhibited high, high creep. There was a direct correlation between the, the between drying shrinkage and creep. The higher the creep, the higher the drying shrinkage, and, and conversely. Apparently, the uh, the uh, higher strains induced by this increased uh, drying shrinkage more than offset any uh, uh, additional strain relaxation because of of increased creep. Obviously, I think there's some additional research is necessary to quantify the effect of creep, to particularly. Tensile Creek on cracking resistance of repair materials. Although there was a limited correlation between some of the indi individual material properties and field performance, I think results of this study indicate that it may be possible to predict or to specify dimensionally compatible materials based on a combination of, of properties. Now, you can't just select one material property and uh, the result of a laboratory test and expect to, to get a adequate field performance. It has to be a combination of them. Consequently, we've come up with uh, the proposed performance criteria shown here. 
this is not an end all. It's a, it should be considered as a general profile of desired material properties. Uh, the relative importance of individual properties will vary depending on the application exposure conditions. Given your specific uh, exposure conditions, one, of the, one or, other, or two of these properties might become much more important. So they would have to be weighted relative to the importance of the others. Uh, this is a, we, we think the, the requirements uh, should be modified as appropriate for, for any specific repair conditions. As it turned out, there basically there's, there's a, a total of seven criteria that we've come up with. So how do the materials that we evaluated, how do they meet this? Well, as that turned out, none of the materials meet all seven of, of the criteria. Two materials satisfied six of the, of the uh, criteria, and they were in the top three ranked materials as far as performance was concerned. Uh, the, uh, as it turned out, uh, those materials that were rated satisfactory as field performance, they averaged, on an average, they met about 65% of the criteria. Uh, those that were uh, uh, marginal and unsatisfactory, they were down to about 40%. So there was some correlation between the, the, the number of the criteria that were satisfied and field performance. Interesting thing to note that conventional concrete uh, met five of the seven criteria and it only missed drying shrinkage by less than 10% and tensile strength by approximately 15%. So really, con the conventional concrete control was probably as uh, come as near as to meeting the, uh, uh, the, the performance criteria as any material. And we're back to what some of us have been uh, saying for a long time, that uh, we need to consider repairing like with like. We attempted to select 12 as I said earlier, commercially available repair materials that represent a wide range in composition, uh, particularly in properties, particularly drying shrinkage. However, during evaluations of material data sheets from numerous suppliers and manufacturers, it became obvious that the engineer has very limited and somewhat and sometimes uh, misleading information on which to base this selection and uh, specification of materials. Uh, in some cases, apparently only data that uh, uh, only data on those properties that were favorable to the particular material were reported. Also, we saw a lot of modified uh, data, uh, test methods, and the modifications were often poorly documented. Uh, consequently, we developed a standard data sheet protocol for uh, cement-based repair materials as a part of this study. Uh, the proposed data sheet protocol will be discussed in detail in the repair committee meeting tomorrow morning, and I, I would solicit your attendance and, uh, and discussion and input. Uh, as I said, this, uh, it's, we've discussed it with a number of you, and uh, generally we got good reception that if we could come up with a, a standard uh, protocol for, for the types of tests uh, that uh, should be conducted on cement-based repair materials, then we could all compare apples and apples instead of oranges and oranges. Also, there's a, a need for a new or improved test method whereby potential for cracking can be accurately uh, quantified. Uh, any such test method must be able to account for the interrelationship of a combination of, repair, uh, of material properties. Uh, I think that the, the German angle, the more that I've looked at it, has a good potential in this. Uh, obviously, you would have to cycle the material through the expected exposure conditions because, as I said before, as long as it was under the controlled standard laboratory conditions, we did not get any, any cracking. But under field conditions, uh, only four of the materials did not crack in the German angle uh, test. Also, the four materials that did not crack uh, satisfied 75% of the performance criteria compared to about on, uh, only 45% for the remaining. And also, three of these four materials that did not crack were rated in the top four for uh, performance of simulated repairs. So I, I think there's, this method may have potential and some other things that we can do with it. So uh, this, again, will be a, a subject for the repair committee is, is what are appropriate test methods for restrain the contraction. Results of this study also emphasize the need for a, a comprehensive analytical model to, to predict the cracking resistance of repair materials. Uh, a model that would, again, will just like a test method, address the interrelationship of pertinent material properties and the relative importance of these uh, individual properties. David Scott's going to talk more about this in, in the next presentation. Uh, additional information is available in a number of sources. The uh, reports, there are Corps of Engineers reports on the, 
the uh, laboratory field and summary reports. Uh, there you can get more information from the Reamer homepage. Uh, I don't expect you to remember that address if you'll just search on REMR, which is the acronym for Repair, Evaluation, Maintenance, and Rehabilitation. Then all of the reports in that area will come up. So I uh, thank you for your attention. in the Structures Laboratory uh, of the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center uh, as, a, uh, as a research engineer. Uh, David's primary areas of interest are in structural strengthening and really the modeling uh, uh, of, of material behavior. And with that, we'll uh, uh, bring up Scott. Um, can I just use the microphone here? Great, thanks. <coughs> um, make sure everybody can see who I am. Let's see. Yeah, there we are. Um, as uh, as Jim said, my name uh, my name is David Scott, and I I do work with the Corps. And uh, just to, to start off the uh, <coughs> the uh, um, presentation, you never never supposed to apologize, but I will apologize. My throat has been a Giving me a little bit of trouble here lately, so I'm gonna try to. Uh, if I if you can't hear me or anything, please just uh, just let me know. Um, one of the things I'll let you know is that today is uh, is is got to be categorized as a success for me, no matter what happens in the talk, because uh, getting after the uh, after this session, I get to go call my mom and tell her that uh, I had lunch today and actually had a tomato sauce based entree and didn't get any on my shirt or on my tie. That's a, a new record for me. So uh, today has been a success, no matter what. <clears throat> um, I've been with the Corps about two years and uh, started started there in August of 97 and my primary uh, research background was in uh, looking at the viscoelastic behavior of uh, fiber reinforced polymeric materials and those of you who have uh, experience with the uh, use of these FRP materials carbon glass Kevlar for strengthening concrete structures are familiar with these types of, of systems well I had looked at some of the time dependent modeling characteristics of these materials uh, and so whenever I when I first came on with the core or not not when I first came on but Jim came to me one afternoon and, and we were talking and he asked me about uh, you know asking if I wanted to look at perhaps look at some modeling methodologies for some of these cementitious repair materials and I was naive enough to say sure you know it shouldn't be any any problem whatsoever you know you finish your dissertation you know it all right and so uh, uh, anyway that's been my uh, my introduction we've really just started with this uh, with this work, but it's a it's, it's a really fascinating concept, and it's it's one that I think is 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 really really important for what we're trying to do, which is marry you know the the repair industry is a is really an art and a science, and and model prediction is exactly the same way. You know you have to have some good hard science, but you also have to have some expertise and some experience and some art to make the to to to, to make your predictions you know work out to what you're seeing in the real world because you can have a lot of very uh, elegant theories and. One ugly fact will uh, will dispel them every time. Earlier this year, uh, we got together in New Hampshire with uh, with a group of people who were interested in the uh, 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 performance of repair materials, and we had a discussion based on this uh, this topic. And uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about here, or most of what I'm going to talk about here, is what we what uh, what I presented up there, and also what we talked about. And so, uh, you know, what we're moving forward. What I'd like to get out of this, it's not really a I'll talk about some of the results that we have for, for my work, to, for our work today. To just a few, just some of the results. But what I'd really like to do is introduce some of the concepts that we have for, that 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 I found in my survey of the literature for uh, modeling these materials, and to solicit, uh, hopefully, solicit some discussion on where do we go from here. Uh, there are some things that we're doing with the uh, with the Corps of Engineers, but there are some other things that, uh, uh, some issues that have to be addressed, and there, uh, hopefully, we can get some 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 discussion and some good input on those. Uh, the objectives, as I said, of my uh, of my talk is to outline what the challenges are when you're uh, trying to develop a model for these cementitious repair materials. You're talking about non-homogeneous materials in a lot of cases, uh, non-isotropic in a lot of cases, certainly time-dependent. Uh, developing material models are, are really tough. Uh, talk about what some of the current methodologies are 
what are the methods that are used, the overlying scientific principles that are used to develop these models, and discuss some of the current state of practice models that we have and, and, and that we've looked at. Now, uh, in cementitious uh, repair materials, uh, what we've what we've what we found so far, and what 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 uh, certainly came out of out of, out of Jim's study, was some of the uh, some of the traditionally applied causes for for deformations that occur in in repair materials. Obviously, we have the the things that make the most sense: applied stresses uh, in a surface repair. That's not usually as big a case, but but still, in uh, where where you have applied loads, they obviously are a large percentage of your deformations. Uh, moisture content for uh, what type of of curing situation that you're in, develop, depending on both uh, external conditions, climatic conditions, and internal conditions uh, related to cure, particularly for large, massive structures, as Jim talked about, we have certain issues with those. Uh, thermal strain, uh, thermal changes with uh, with regard to the temperature that goes along with the uh, with the hygronomic effects, uh, the moisture effects, and the chemical effects, which is just autogenous shrinkage, which again for uh, surface repairs you wouldn't think would be <coughs> as large a deal because you don't have uh, as much volume. Uh, certainly for, for some of the massive concrete structures that we deal with in the core, uh, this is more of an issue. However, as you'll see later, some of the people who have done some research in this area think that autogenous shrinkage has a, uh, a very large component and has to be considered. Uh, as, as far as the, the major types of deformation, uh, uh, these are the causes and the major types of deformations follow along from that. From the applied stresses you have instantaneous elastic strains, <coughs> strains due to creep, uh, shrinkage, and due to thermal effects. These are the, these are the major you know, quantification types of, of points for, for looking at deformation and repair material, and that's what we're really talking about when we're talking about cracking. You know, that's, a, that's the easiest thing for us to relate to, both as an elastic medium and as a, as a, as a, as a fractured medium, is, is the deformation in the system. What I'd like to do is kind of break this into several components. The first I'd like to talk about is what I, what I termed, it's, it's my own terminology, the so-called traditional approach, which, uh, which has a lot, of, a lot of benefits and a lot of, uh, a lot of simplicity to it. And uh, it's, a, it's more of a mechanics and more of a tensile capacity based approach. But um, the foundations are that the ability of a repair material to resist cracking is dependent on these factors, uh, which Jim talked about in great detail in the previous presentation. I won't go over uh, other than to say that where a lot of the debate is currently ongoing regarding these types of materials is in the relative importance of each one of those. You saw Jim's correlations, and he and I have had several discussions about his, uh, Jim's correlations on, on, on some of that data and you know, how, how, you, how you interpret that sort of thing. And there's, so there's, that, that, it's certainly open to a lot of controversy. So uh, determining which items actually affect the, uh, the, the, the cracking potential of a, of a material is not, not completely understood, but at least we, we have a, a handle on what the factors are. But the, the, the real controversy right now is the, is, is the relative importance. Uh, the, uh, the approach that, uh, that we started with, the simplest, what made sense, was the approach based on uh, a semi-empirical approach based on power law models for the, uh, for the coefficients. That's where we have data. Uh, certain amount of data for a repair material. We use that to short, relatively short-term data to predict long-term performance. And this is, this is an approach that's been adopted by ACI 209. It was adopted, I think, in 1982 first, and then it's been refined, re-approved in 1986, and then it's been refined since then. Uh, but it's, 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 it's fairly standard, and it's actually, you know, standard for, for a variety of materials, both with, with polymers and with, with cementitious materials. Uh, basically, you take a, a semi-empirical prediction model. Uh, for example, for creep, it's a, it's a power law model there. You see that uh, basically you have a creep. In this case, it's a specific creep, which is a uh, total creep divided by the in, uh, instantaneous elastic strain. And you say that that is a function of time. And these are material parameters that are determined from short-term testing uh, along with the ultimate creep strain. Shrinkage is, a, is, a, is an exact replicate model. Again, you use data from, your, from, from tests to, uh, to determine, to determine these, these parameters for uh, your time dependency. Uh, ACI, for, uh, ACI has proposed these models for standard concrete, uh, moist concrete that were uh, cured and for you know, one in three days steam cured concrete. They have Rather than having just just all the data, they they they've provided these coefficients from from a, from a large statistical analysis that they did. In these um, 
models that, that ACI has proffered, they also have correction factors, and they have correction factors based on moisture conditions, thermal conditions, et cetera. Uh, what we did in looking at it was we decided that, 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 that we, would look, we would start looking at crack prediction based on, based on these models, but we would start from the model itself. And what I mean is we have the data from Jim's, uh, from the study, the previous study by the, uh, by the Corps and by SBS. And so we decided to use that data rather than try to use a, try to fit a, 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 a different model into our, into our data. And so we used a, a very simple prediction. Again, it's based on ultimate, we, we, it's very difficult to talk about ultimate strain capacity uh, particularly time-dependent strain capacity in concrete. People are much more familiar with tensile capacity, and so while we all uh, know that stress is a, a somewhat uh, dubious term, we know that things deform, we don't know how they stress, uh, it's easier to, th to think of things in terms of, those, in terms of those quantities. And so what we did is we said, uh, looking at a crack prediction, we, we, we compare the tensile strength of the material to the tensile stress induced by the deformations. And what we try to do is account for as much of the deformation as we can. And we started with, uh, with this model, which shows the effective modulus is, is, is a, uh, the uh, initial modulus, which is modified by the creep coefficient. Then we further adjusted this with the so-called aging, uh, age-adjusted effective modulus, which has its aging coefficient, which was determined by Bazant in 1972, which takes into account the redistribution of stresses in the, uh, in the system as creep and shrinkage occur. And uh, for, again, we, we, we chose a couple of the materials. I'm just gonna sh not going to show you all the curves, but just show you a couple of the curves that we have here. This is for material number 11. We basically plotted the data uh, and, and determined our coefficients there from the, uh, from the tensile creep. This is from the, uh, the tensile creep uh, data in, 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 in the uh, previous study. And we plotted the creep data. And uh, just to show you what Jim was talking about, you can see, obviously, the magnitudes of the the strains are much different. Uh, magnitude of the coefficient term here is much different. Uh, but but we got. Uh, it depends on 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 who you're talking to. If you're uh, in the numerical simulation, you probably wouldn't call that a a very good uh, correlation. As a as a beam buster myself, I think that looks pretty good. And so you know it kind of runs right through the middle. And for Jim, I'm sure it's perfect. Excellent. Um, actually, yeah, Jim's 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 methodology for correlation that looks looks pretty good. That's right. That's right. That's Mississippi good. This is, <laughs> this is the definition of close enough for government work. Now, here's the uh, this, this slide that uh, Jimbo guarded from me for his last presentation. Uh, you can see that we showed that uh, in this case, we again our simplified model did a pretty good job. You know, we uh, predicted it to crack. These, by the way, these uh, times to crack were uh, the ring model, the ring test model. That was what we had our had our information from that was the, what we had what we felt like the most reliable information of time to crack and so that's what we used and so we had a predicted time to crack of, of, of about 11 days actual time is about 15 days we felt pretty comfortable with that you know pretty good pretty good correlation and we looked at it for a variety of materials and overall for about half the materials it seemed to have done pretty well we're still we're still analyzing some of the data there were some problems with the analysis or with the with the reduction of the data but uh, for, for, for about half the materials, they work pretty well, but as I said, you know, for, for other materials, it was, you know, we, 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 we did not find as quite as good a correlation. Here you can see this is for material number nine. Both these were cementitious materials, by the way, not, none of these were the polymer modified materials in there. And for both these cementitious, for this cementitious material, again, fairly good correlation. Uh, this is not completely, not completely different as far as the overall numbers for the shrinkage data between comparing that to material number uh, 11 that we proffered. We wanted to get data with, with, with similar or similar magnitudes. Felt like it'd be easier to compare, or I felt like it would. And again, creep data, pretty good, pretty good show. And again, you show that uh, not everything. This is this would not qualify as close enough for government work. We predicted the uh, time to crack there to be around 60 days, uh, actually 57 days. And you can see that the uh, the actual time it did crack the first time was at 23 days. However, notice that, that, you know, depending on what your scale is, this is a, this can be a real tough, this is an asymptotic approach. And, and while it, it definitely has some merit, it's tough to refine because it is asymptotic. You know, it's, it's tough to get those curves to change uh, parametrically. 
um, great, a great deal unless you have very fine scientific data, unless you have very fine differentiated data. And so that, that presents a real challenge. And how we're going to solve it, I'm not sure yet. But so we had, we've had some good luck and some bad luck with that. There's been additional uh, models, and I'll talk about some of these others. Uh, this is a model that uh, Rod Myers at, at the Master Builders actually is, uh, had sent me this, and I'm not plugging for him, I'm just saying that's, that's who the, the model that came by. And they, they've uh, proffered this cracking potential index, and this is based on uh, inducing a shear stress into a repair material, assuming it's restrained at one end, free to deform at the other end. You, you have an induced shear stress there if you allow it to deform, and you, know, you can go through the algebra. I've got the paper. You can see this in more detail if you want to, but you can just trust me, the letters line up. Uh, you, you, you induce this stress and you use the fact, or you assume the material is isotropic and, uh, and homogeneous, and so you make some, uh, uh, some assumptions, and then they, they reduced it, or th in this formula it was reduced down to where they ignored the effects of the creep strain. They, they said that the drying shrinkage strain, which, which the model, which the, the data we have so far predicted shows, and, and as Jim said, uh, obviously shows that the, 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 the drying shrinkage strain is obviously much greater than the other two, and so it's really uh, much more of a predictor of the, uh, of the material performance. And they used, because shear stress, uh, anybody who's tried to do a direct shear measurement on concrete specimens, tell you it's a very difficult test, and the, the data has been uh, accused by some as specious at best, uh, a, a more reliable number is split tension, and they felt like they could correlate, or, or they proffered that you can correlate uh, shear stress to split tensile stress. And so they come up with this, not as a specific number, but again, as, a, as, a, as an index of whether things can crack. And so we took our materials and compared it to this, to this index, and compared that to our sum of cracks with, our sum of crack widths for our ring test, and found that we had some, some level of, of, of correlation with the uh, with, with this index. So it, it, it did show some, some potential there. Here you can see it. Uh, this is a correlation I made of this. Same thing here where you, you, you compare the crack width versus the uh, potential for the, for the material crack or the proffered potential. And it, and it does show a general trend in what the, uh, what the material does. This is a, 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 a system that's been uh, was put out several years ago. I think in 1992, I believe, uh, Conproco had uh, developed this model, and it's again, it's it's a it's 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 a very effective. It's they're all these all these models are based on very similar types of of analyses, and so they're not they're not wildly different. They're just 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 by degrees, and this obviously is the uh, cracking potential. Looking at uh, so-called again, this is an in, a reserve number, an index number. This is the tensile capacity of the of the concrete, and this is the uh, 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 some sort of in, again an induced stress type number. This 33 theta to the three half square root FC prime. Most, most y'all recognize that Portland Cement Association is the uh, formula for modulus. This works for a variety of materials. This is your peak shrinkage strain, and this is a stress reduction factor, which is unitless which is, uh, is used to modify, account for things like uh, temperature and other things, is used to modify this number. Uh, in the Conproco formula, there are some limitations that were placed on the formula, uh, which certainly makes sense. Uh, properties need to be for the same cure period. You cannot use wildly varying uh, curing <coughs> techniques for your, for your uh, materials and expect to get consistent results. Uh, the test you must simulate the actual field conditions to be valid, as Jim has talked about with the the uh, German angle test, that, that certainly makes uh, a lot of sense as well, but it's, it's an important thing to consider, particularly when you're talking about standardizing this information, because if you have people who standardize information based on laboratory tests and you use that in the field, it's, it's, it's tough to correlate. Uh, that expression for modulus elasticity, again, came from the Portland Cement Association. It's really uh, most useful. It's applied to materials between the three and 6,000 PSI range, and the absolute scale has not been developed. Um, there's no specific number that says this is, this is good, this is bad. Obviously, you know, simple arithmetic, a negative number is undesirable. In talking about, uh, in, in what I talked about earlier, looking at another very simplified model of this, this was done by, uh, or proffered by Holton Jansen. Uh, Dr. Jansen's at the University of Washington right now, I believe, and uh, Dr. Holt is with the uh, Technical Research Center in Finland, and they, they uh, looked at early age volume changes to see how that affected, and they they assert that 
autogenous expansion is a very large component of, of, of predicting the cracking potential or, or, or uh, reliable crack prediction in cementitious materials. Um, while I was at, uh, uh, at, the, at the conference in, in, in April talking to, while we were having the workshop, uh, one of the gentlemen from Canada had mentioned that, that they had found, they were doing some preliminary tests and they had found significant autogenous expansion. And this was in, in, in Portland cement concrete. They were doing not necessarily a, a repair material per se. But they account for the autogenous expansion and then they use this K factor which corrects for a variety of, of things. And this, this K factor, again, uh, you know, talks about uh, uh, dealing with the, with the partial restraint of the, uh, of the steel ring. How do, you, how do you deal with the fact that some of the, some of the shrinkage that, that, that's in the material is taken up in the ring as opposed to the, the, the true a slab concept where you have a, a, an infinite slab around a repair material. Uh, looking at the difference in the drying conditions, where you're talking about the ring system versus unresained shrinkage specimens, you have different volume to surface area ratios. They, they, they try to quantify that by the volume to, uh, to surface area ratio. And uh, finally, they, they, they included, uh, uh, in the K factor, they said that this also includes creep data. Now, what they did, they didn't actually proffer a real uh, methodology to determine the K factor. What they did is they took some data and they, they found that for their un unmodified prediction formulas, uh, didn't have the, uh, these, these two factors. They, they predicted that the uh, plain and fiber reinforced concrete would fail in 9 and 15 days, and it was actually 60 and 300 days actual. And so after they uh, ran this and, and found their K factor and, you know, compared it to the data and found their K factor and then plugged back in, wonder of wonders, it matched exactly. Pretty amazing uh, result in my opinion. But, uh, but that does show that these, these, these things are, are real world, you know, real factors. Talking about uh, some about creep and shrinkage models. Uh, some of the things that are used, that are used to develop these crack prediction models. Probably the largest accumulation of test data uh, that exists is, is, uh, was started in Northwestern in the late 70s. Anybody who's familiar with uh, Dr. Shaw's and Dr. Bazant's work at uh, Northwestern knows that in the 70s they started collecting data points based on, a, on their series of creep tests and shrinkage tests. And they've, they had uh, started with about 10,000 data points, uh, at which point the ACI and the uh, CEB uh, began to collaborate with them to, to, to expand this, this uh, this, this test bank, and now it's, it's become the, or it's, it's morphed into the Rylum data bank, which has about 600 measured time curves and 100 test series worldwide. It has about 15,000 data points. They use this model, they use these models for their numerical simulations uh, for, for concrete. And here are the, uh, the models that they, that they use this data for. They started with the so-called BP model, then the BPKX model, and now they have the, the B3 model which has uh, been simplified by sensitivity analysis, uses a theoretical expression for creep rather than just the empirical expression, and it's calibrated. What they do is they use the theoretical expression and they calibrate it using the data set. And uh, this has recently been approved by ACI 209 for use. Again, this, this, this model is used with a, uh, in, in a finite element method to, uh, to, to, to numerically uh, calculate creep strains on a, on a cross section. Uh, and that brings us to uh, the other major methodology for predicting cracks, and it's probably uh, it's one of the more recent, but 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 it has a lot of a lot of proponents, and it has a lot of uh, real value in it, and it certainly makes sense. And that's using a fracture mechanics approach. It is a a much more complicated approach, but it is a uh, there there are a lot of of, of, of scientific ba there's a lot of scientific basis for looking at it, and it relates uh, cracking potential in a material to fracture energy rather than tensile strength. Uh, it says that the tensile strength is not a determining factor. All the, the other empirical models and even the ones that are based on elementary mechanics look at tensile strength as your, as your primary component. This says that, that, that you have to relate this to a, to a different component. Uh, this, these models are, these kind of predictions are very useful in that you can use, you can use them to predict repairs use, or predict situations where you have conventional reinforcement. You can account for conventional reinforcement in your scenario. Whether this, you know, these, these models were not designed specifically for repairs, these were designed for uh, new con you know, concrete new construction. Uh, but it can also be used <coughs> to account for effects in fiber reinforced concrete. And this is important because uh, many of you know when you're, when you're adding uh, the addition of fibers to a, to a system can often significantly change the cracking potential of the concrete, but it doesn't always significantly change tensile capacity. There's a variety of factors that deal with that. Um, 
The other, the other thing that makes us the traffic is that in this system, the effects of the specimen dimensions, the things like volume to surface ratio, all this geometry is explicitly included in the system. And uh, talking about the basic cur uh, approach, what you do is you have a, a fracture resistance, and you compare this fracture resistance, which, which they, which they uh, use, in, in, uh, Dr. Shaw described as an R curve, which is basically just the rate of change of energy at the crack tip. Um, with respect to the overall length, and it's designated as a, as a crack resistance force. And the strain energy release rate, G, is just the, the rate of strain and energy release, and it's called the crack driving force. And so you compare these two, two numbers, and you can use an energy method solution to compare their uh, rates of, of, of occurrence uh, with respect to the crack opening, or crack opening length. And because I have to, I just, you know, you can't go with the presentation without having some sort of weird formulas up there. I decided to put this one up there. Basically, what this, uh, what I wanted to show here, is just to let you know that the, this crack driving force is based on linear elastic fracture mechanics, and uh, you use a numerical boundary element method that we talked about to determine the stress and fi intensity factor. And this numerical boundary element method contains information on the on the creep and, and shrinkage data. This uh, crack resistance force has these components, which are material parameters that are also uh, are determined from the data bank and also use a, 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 an elastic fr uh, fracture mechanics approach. Uh, when we talk about this, uh, again, the R curve in this case uh, is, is used to describe the shrinkage cracking in the ring test. And you compute the maximum allowable tensile strain, and you estimate the influence of creep, and you predict these, this cracking using measured free shrinkage, computed tensile strain, and estimated creep. So you only have one component of, of actual measured data. And it, and it works uh, really, really well. Uh, one of the, some of the issues that revolve with the fracture mechanics approach, it, it is numerically in, in, intensive. It's, it's, it's very much so. Another question that, uh, that people have, have brought up, while it does, uh, let me back up, while it does certainly account for all of these different items, the fact that it accounts for them explicitly makes it very difficult to generalize to a class of materials, which makes it you know, much more difficult to use on a, on a generic basis with generic material properties, uh, because so many things are included in the analysis. But uh, it, 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 it definitely produces very good results when it's used in a controlled experiment. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I went too far. Now finally, what I'd like to talk a little bit about is, is, is what are our issues and concerns? What, what, are we, what are we still what are we still dealing with at this point? And some of the stuff that we've done. And finally, the, the, the first thing we're looking at is, is we're saying, what are we trying to model? What are we, what are we actually modeling here? And the uh, question comes back again, you know, which test, the German angle test, the ring test, the actual repair, you know, there are, there are autogenous and volumetric considerations that have to be concerned. And so when, you, when you're trying to model, can you, can you strip this out and get a, a, useful, a useful model out of it, or must they be explicitly included? Uh, what are the relevant properties? Uh, as Jim talked about, one of the things that, uh, that, that we're doing right now at, at, at West, and I, I haven't presented anything on it because I haven't, we haven't finished it yet, but is to look at the, at the coefficient of thermal expansion. How does that coefficient of thermal expansion, in, uh, how is that included into the, into the model prediction? Uh, most of the work that's been done, again, done to date is a, is a, is a uh, where you where you take a gross data where you take gross data you come out with a gross factor and you, you plug it in and it works but but how can we separate and isolate the uh, effect of that uh, coefficient of thermal expansion um, how do we quantify these numbers creep and shrinkage uh, that somewhat uh, has been worked on to a, to, a, to a much greater degree there's a variety of models I, I only showed a couple of them there's a variety of models for creep and shrinkage, creep and shrinkage behavior. Uh, this, these models are, are just some of the ones that I have found that, uh, that seem to work, but, but again, they don't necessarily contain all of the, uh, the components. Uh, thermal expansion and, and other things are also, also affect the creep and shrinkage behavior. Do you include them explicitly in those models, or do you include it separately in the, in the model approach? Again, what approach can and should be used? Tensile strength versus the fracture mechanics approach, theoretical versus empirical models. And this is, this is the tough call, um, and we talked about this a lot at the workshop, is that you know, how, how do we deal with these, de with these issues? The fracture mechanics approach is a much more, much more grounded scientific approach. However, for, for, for a useful model for the, for the repair industry, 
it, 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 it's got, there's a lot of tough, tough questions that have to be answered, and there's a lot of tough work that has to be done. Uh, same as theoretical versus empirical models. What do we deal with? What do we call an accurate model? Uh, is, a, is an index which shows a, a greater propensity to crack, is that a sufficient model to use? Or is a model which actually has a, a prediction number in it, uh, you know, is that necessary for the types of repairs that we do? And finally, how do we deal with the test data from the various materials? And this is one place where I think that, that what we started with the, with the core and what I hope will come out of, of future work, both, both in the private sector and in the public sector, is to try to try to gather and, and collect this, this test data and try to make some sense of it. That's a, that's a very powerful tool to use, but we have to have it. We have to have access to it. A lot of this material is proprietary, certainly that, that makes sense, and, and other, other of the information is just not, you know, just not used, but to be able to collect the data and, and to properly analyze it, I mean, it's, it's a major undertaking, but I think it's something that will really, really help us. Um, in, our, in our workshop, we described, we, we came out of there and we described that a procedure where we looked at three level models. We have a level one model, which is under, for standard geometric config, configuration under uh, standard isothermal conditions. And the second model uh, is a simulated field condition model for the short term. And the third model, level three model, is to, model, to uh, include field conditions for the long term. Right now, we're obviously still only in a level one model approach, but how we, what kind of information we get out of there will be very instrumental in what we do in our level two approach and our level three approach. Uh, one opinion might be that, that for the level one and perhaps part of the level two approach, a, a mechanics type of approach or a, a, a strength of materials type approach will be sufficient, but for the level three approach, when you're including the long-term effects, some sort of numerical approach, which includes the fracture mechanics, will probably have to be considered. Um, I think that is all that I have to talk about. And I hope I didn't go too fast. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to uh, to take them. Yes, sir. The R curves. You mean the the creep curves or the? Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, that's what you do. Like for a Finley power law model with uh, with FRP materials, we did look at that. We didn't get as good a, as 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 good a results as if we used this this power law model. But that we we've definitely done that with the. Uh, for the uh, uh, with, with with the materials as well, and we've actually looked at at two or three different power law models. In this case, these seem to so far have done the best, but we haven't incorporated the uh, the temperature and the and the uh, some some other properties of like volume uh, service to volume ratio into our power law models yet. But but we yeah we have looked at that. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Who would I? Argue with Dr. Well, I'm not here to argue. I just want to clarify one thing. First of all, for the purposes of truth, and secondly, for future levels of the model. When Scott was talking, uh, David Scott was speaking about uh, different approaches for the model and different backgrounds for cracking, he kind of uh, put against each other tensile strain capacity and fracture mechanics. Uh, the problem is, and I'm probably representing the old school, which accept both. When crack occurs in a brittle material, which repair materials and concrete is this, when tensile strengths of this material is exceeded by tensile stress. So tensile strength capacity governs the occurrence of the crack. Now, when crack occurs, it starts to propagate. And this is where it has nothing to do with tensile strength of material and tensile strain capacity. The propagation of the crack has to do with the toughness of the material, which toughness of the material is governed by fractural mechanics rules. So both are taking place in a material. I, I, I absolutely agree. However, Thank you. when you are predicting creep, uh, or when you're predicting this type of behavior, you take both to the limit. And at the limit is where they intersect. And so yeah, you but, but you have to take definitely both. Absolutely. You are not saying the fractural mechanics, this is what the governance on a higher level. This is both are taking place. And another thing, when 
uh, one model was presented here. You remember the assumption that concrete was or cement-based material was assumed as a homogeneous material. Uh, if we're gonna go with such assumptions, our models are never gonna give us any close answer. Concrete is very well known as a material with uniform non-uniformity. So you cannot make such an assumption. It's my view. due for a break now and um, let's see what time is it it's almost a quarter to four and we're due to go back on with the, to hear from Kelly Hol uh, Kelly Page from Holdem Cement so uh, why don't we all come back at uh, 410 if you don't mind taking you know cutting your break just a little bit short we'll get back on track and be back in here at 410 thanks <laughs> <laughs>